Hi, good, good afternoon. If there is ever a, uh, a reason for us to have standards, <laughs> this is it. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, my apologies for the video quality that you're going to see because uh, uh, the slide quality is going through three layers of conversions before it uh, comes to the thing. Uh, good afternoon. I stand between you and your drinks, so I will I'll try to speed it up and uh, get you out of the way here. Uh, my name is Mohan Kumar. I'm a fellow in uh, Intel's uh, data center group. Uh, I work on the rack scale architecture. Uh, if you had gone to the uh, keynote session, Jason Waxman uh, had talked about uh, briefly about rack scale architecture, I wanted to show you uh, the, uh, the reason for the, module, the approach we are taking and the modularity and that stuff. And this was just gravy, this whole thing working out <laughs> the way it did. Um, so quickly, uh, for those of you who don't know much about it, I wanted to give you a quick overview of what rack scale design is all about, and then talk primarily about the software side of it, which is the, uh, how we do the manageability in rack scale. And I also want to uh, talk about some of the uh, future things that are coming up uh, in the pipeline, uh, just to give you a flavor for what you uh, can hear about, uh, perhaps if you come in uh, to OCP 18. Um, so uh, why, did we, why did we go down the path of rack scale, right? We wanted to have uh, a solution that essentially took, uh, that, that wanted, we wanted to provide a complete solution for a software-defined data center. And today you have kind of these three problems, right? One is uh, hardware, there are stranded resources in your platform, right? You don't have, you, you watch what people want is the right size platform to show up and they would just, they would just use it. That basically maximizes utilization. And then you want your data center, now that with private cloud and so on, you want your data center to scale, right? As you add more resources, they need to be added seamlessly. And that doesn't, uh, in a traditional enterprise environment, that, that was not the model, right? You, you used up to the peak of your uh, capacity or utilization, and then you had to come bring in a brand new uh, device in the environment. But that's not how hyperscale works. So what we want is to bring the value of hyperscale into uh, to the uh, private and uh, all the other, other cloud solutions. And you want interoperable solutions. You want it to be uh, that these solutions work together. And in order to do that, the, the path that we took was, you know, first of all, you needed to have a solution that had a single pane of class management, whether it was compute, network, or storage. And secondly, in order to get this right size, you know, the, the, just the right platform for your needs, uh, first thing we needed to do was to take the system as it exists today, which com consists of a CPU, memory, uh, you know, storage, uh, FPGA, all these IO devices, networking, and disaggregate it, and then put it back together in the way that you would like to see it, uh, see it right? If you wanted to have a specific resource, like and you wanted to have two SSDs, you should be able to see two SSDs. You wanted to see four SSDs, you should be able to see four SSDs show up in your uh, composed system. And that's, that's really what we're going for with rack scale design. And uh, going into the, uh, the rack scale design framework, essentially, uh, we are at OCP, so I uh, want to make sure that uh, first I start off with saying that what we are driving is a open logical reference architecture. That means we're not saying you must design, uh, you must pick these components, you must put them together this way, right? What, that's, not, that's not what we are about with, with rack scale, right? In OCP, there is lots of designs that for you to choose from, and we will uh, work uh, on top of those designs. But it's designed to be uh, a modular management architecture. Essentially, what that means is that on whether it's compute storage or networking, we have a layer of management. And that management, we do have requirements on how that management is uh, implemented. And th that means we need to, uh, we, need some we have some requirements on how that management hardware is uh, provisioned, how, what that firmware is, and what management software runs on it. Uh, we do have some requirements on that. And how do, we, uh, how do we enforce that requirements, if you will? That's through uh, compliance and interop programs that are in, in the work. Right, so, so the, the foundational principles are then, and, and the scale at, that, at which we are trying to do this is, uh, first of all, you know, we want to change the unit of this management to uh, a, a rack level, right? And in fact, to multiple racks, which we call a pod in our uh, parlance. And those parts are essentially managed through a single pod manager. Why, why multiple, 
why a rack? Because we want to be able to manage compute network and storage together. Why multiple racks? Because you wanted to have this, uh, I mean, in, in a private cloud deployment, you want to have that scale in the first place. And the second reason is that uh, disaggregating an IO device at a rack level is interesting, but not that valuable than as opposed to you know, being able to do that across multiple, multiple racks in your environment. And, and that's what gives you the scalability, because now you can add the next rack in, and it seamlessly fits together with the existing environment. And that's what we're going for. So um, this is kind of the evolution of uh, the, the path that we are taking in terms of uh, uh, you know, getting this to fruition. Uh, first, we started off with essentially defining this uh, single pane of glass uh, management. Um, and in, in order to do that, you know, first of all, we needed to go beyond uh, just the compute to look at both storage and uh, networking and create those, create those en environment. And also we needed to be able to manage at scale, right? It's uh, you're managing at you know, 10 to 12 racks together in this RST pod. And, and, and then the next step to it is to essentially go, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about it, is to talk, you know, look into resource pooling, essentially pool IO, you know, essentially free your IO devices like storage and FPGAs and so on from the tyranny of uh, mechanicals, right? Today, you're, uh, you can have as big a, as big a capacity or performant uh, SSD, uh, I mean, storage system as your storage box allows, right? No more than that, right? And that's what we're trying to break with the resource pooling, and I'll talk to it. And then we are gonna look further into, uh, you know, uh, new memory and uh, storage hierarchies as new memory technologies uh, show up and be able to, uh, you know, essentially pool them the same way we are doing this, and be able to eventually end up in a world, you know, everything is composable resource. So uh, given that world, the first thing to conquer was the manageability portion, right? And how do, we, how do you go about that, right? First thing is, uh, you know, our mantra on, on, on the software side essentially is, is, you know, create and donate. Right, so even though we call it RST APIs, we create and we donate it to the various standards. We work with the standard bodies to make them part of those standards. And, uh, and I think it's probably very similar to the OCP's mantra because you create and donate as well into, uh, on the hardware side. Um, the, the management framework basically builds on, uh, let me see if the, uh, compute, storage, uh, network, and, and the rack level. Given that the rack is disaggregated, things like uh, power cooling uh, and so on. And then also, because we are managing at a rack level, one of the things that we do here is be able to do not only asset management, but also location discovery. Uh, this is not anything like a GPS, but to say, I am in this rack. I, I know I'm not in the other rack. So I, I, you, you have a location awareness, and this is very key when you're gonna do scale level storage software, for example, because uh, it's great to have, you know, be able to make multiple copies of your data, HDFS does that, Ceph does that, and so on. But in, in order for it to be useful in terms of a high availability, you need to know that they're not all in the same failure domain, whether it's because they're on the same rack and on the same power supply or whatever, whatever higher level aggregation that's happening behind you in terms of power, you need to have awareness into that. And we provide that awareness through the uh, rack management uh, entity, right? There is, needs to be some entity that you trust that says you are in rack one, not in rack two. Uh, and and then in order to do the uh, the, the rest of the management, we have this uh, compute element. Uh, we in our terminology again, we call it pool system management engine. Think of it with a BMC with the RST API on top. Uh, try not to say BMC because as soon as I say BMC, people think IPMI. Uh, so this is, uh, I mean, we define the API, but we have worked with. Uh, uh, our partners to contribute it into DMT of Redfish, so right now it is based on the Redfish standards. And, and also, we, uh, originally Redfish started off with ba basically managing compute, so we work with them to define things like uh, uh, storage, and we, we are continuing to work with them on network, and I'll show you in the next couple of slides on what those are. And disaggregated resource management. There's a lot of, uh, you could, you could, you could uh, disaggregate the resources, like for example, JBOTs have existed forever, now they're turning into JBOTs. But the key question is, who's putting them together? There needs to have some other, in, each entity is gonna know its own hardware, right? If you're a JBOT, you know exactly how many hard drives are there. You can do health management of that device. If you're a compute node, or even a multi-compute node, you know how many are there. But the moment you say, I'm gonna take this compute node and take 
two drives and assign it to it. There needs to be some entity that has got the global awareness to be able to put it together and be able to you know, uh, release those resources when it's no longer needed. And in order to do that, we need this comp concept of a composition. And we created a composition API, which now we again have contributed into uh, uh, DMTF, and it's working its way through uh, the standardization process. And once you put it all together, you're, you're managing a system that is a logical system. It's no longer a physical system. So you have interesting, interesting ch challenges that you have to overcome, right? So if my drive is not physically attached to me, and somebody else is reporting an error uh, on, on the storage level, how does that error get surfaced into that compose node, right? These are the challenges that we deal with as we build these things. And the, the layer at which we put together uh, a bunch of racks together is called the pod manager. Uh, pod is essentially the collection of a uh, uh, bunch of racks. It could be a single rack, half a rack, whatever it is, but it's the unit at which we look at it and manage the unit, unit of aggregation, if you will, right? So we do the discovery there, we do the composition there, and we knew the configuration there, and then uh, eventually uh, in the future section you'll see we'll do the telemetry there, meaning we'll also collect all the uh, events. And it's not just, uh, when I say telemetry, it's not just errors, it's also performance and uh, uh, power monitoring and security and all that stuff in there. And eventually what this uh, part manager layer does, again it's got a, a rack scale API that essentially interfaces that to the orchestration stack, and there, we, orchestration, uh, we work with uh, various orchestration partners, OpenStack, uh, VMware, if, uh, any other solution to essentially integrate with their solution, uh, integrate with their OpenStack environment, uh, their uh, orchestration environment, excuse me. So uh, to quickly double click a little bit more into uh, the manageability sta standards here, um, uh, everything that we're doing right now is based on Redfish, right? So Redfish, first of all, is a specification that was done uh, to move the world into the uh, 21st century, if you will, to, to essentially not be a binary protocol, but to move it into more of a HTTP REST-based protocol. That's what it is. And, and it defines a various, number, a various resource model. So the, the idea was to define the spec once, and then you can add, add various models underneath it, and you can add enumerations as you go along, but the basic spec, because at the end of the day, it's using HTTP, so you're doing get, uh, put and post into into this thing that doesn't change very much, right? So that's that's really the foundational element on which we, we were based. Um, and when when and then in the uh, so we we defined uh, we originally defined the uh, the pool system management engine, which is uh, for discussion purposes, think it's a, a super BMC, if you will. Uh, because it can do multi-node, it can do storage, and uh, it can do a network, uh, network switch as well. And then the rack management module is the one that's managing at the rack level and providing the, uh, the, uh, the root of trust for a given rack. Uh, and the pod manager is aggregating these things. That's where the compose, composition APIs exist. All of these things we, we have donated, and they're all in various stages of uh, uh, adoption in, in, in a standard. Uh, most, of the, uh, most of the APIs that are required for you to manage a compute and storage are now part of uh, Redfish and DMTF and uh, something called Swordfish. And they named it Swordfish to kind of show the connection between the two, so they're kind of keeping with the fish theme, I guess, in, the, in this thing. Uh, because there is a division of labor here, uh, DMTF, uh, so the SNEA had traditionally handles storage protocols. So up to the point, a PCIe SSD, if you will, is a PCIe device, it's managed in the, in, the, in the Redfish context, and then when you talk about logical partitions, this is a storage device with a capacity, uh, this, this amount of performance, and I'm gonna partition it and assign that logical volume to somebody, that's in the domain of uh, SNEA and Swordfish. But we work with those guys, uh, with, with both, both bodies to basically drive the standard. And uh, uh, networking switch, Again, as God, it's, I mean, this is all uh, historical, right? Because the, 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 these uh, various bodies existed, so we're kind of trying to work with all of them to bring this together. Uh, the networking uh, solutions, uh, especially switches, the way you, you manage switches are in IETF. So uh, they had uh, what's called the Yang model, and that is how they've been um, managing, again, trying to move into the 21st century with the HTTP and REST-based protocols. And so now, uh, 
we and a bunch of partners worked with them in the context of uh, Redfish to define a Yang to Redfish conversion and pick the protocols that they use to manage a switch. And therefore, so you can manage this, uh, the top of the rack switch uh, that you have in your environment or, an, or even an aggregate switch to using, using this Redfish and that becomes the basis on which we build uh, rack scale. So, uh, you would see that you know, even, even though there are, di there are different bodies, we're kind of doing the same type of uh, approach to what OCP does. And we're trying to drive these things into, into, uh, into standards so you can have this one pane of glass. Uh, so you know, when I said it, it was easy and at the beginning it's one pane of glass, but you have to go through all these steps, unfortunately, to get to that one pane of glass uh, management. But it's, uh, it, it's, it's, been, it's been great to uh, you know, move along. Move, move the ecosystem down this path. So, uh, so what happens when you have an OCP platform, right? Whether it's a uh, compute storage or network, right? Uh, you can build it from the, uh, the wedge or uh, any of the other components that are that are in OCP. Uh, as far as we are concerned, you would support uh, the uh, manageability layer with uh, the Redfish, with the RST API on, on top of it. And I say RST API because RST API basically says, you will do these, these, these versions, portions of Redfish, you will do this portion of Swordfish and so on, right? We basically mandate. Otherwise, you know, as you know, in standards, the specs are, I mean, if you go look at the uh, repository for uh, OCP, it's overwhelming. You need to know exactly what you're looking for in some sense. It's the same thing. We're trying to narrow down the scope to say, this is the, uh, this is the portion of Redfish that is relevant to doing a storage, storage platform. So that's, that's why I say RST and not say, uh, but it is based on Redfish. Uh, and, uh, and then our part manager will then uh, do the composition and aggregation and send it up, uh, present it to the orchestration software, whoever that happens to be in there. Uh, so in fact, uh, I'll show in the next slide that there are this, this type of OCP hardware that's managed through RST is already available. And in fact, you can go to the Intel booth uh, here in the exhibit hall and see some of these designs working under RSD and, and actually being integrated into, uh, into orchestration software. And, uh, and I also, at the, at the bottom of there, you see the URL. That's the Git repository where we donate the code. So uh, I said there are two portions to our, our strategy, right? One is to go de develop these APIs and contribute them to some standard. So you know, we work, to work with the industry to uh, you know, be standard, uh, standardize those APIs. And the other is to develop the reference code, uh, be it firmware or uh, the, the part manager software API, software, and have that reference be available to the industry uh, through this GitHub. Okay, so uh, there, is a, uh, and there is a lot of folks that we uh, work with on this ecosystem. It's, a, it's all about you know, establishing this uh, vibrant ecosystem. Oops, sorry. Uh, ecosystem, so it's a bunch of OEMs. Uh, there's some platforms like the Dell DSS 9000 that you can go see. And they, in fact, uh, this is a great example of uh, what I was talking about. You can go from to, to, you know, bottom to top, if you will, right? From they, they show in their, in their booth, they, in the Dell booth, the DSS 9000 integrates all the, it's a rack scale platform that goes, integrates all the way up to the orchestration stack, I believe they're showing uh, canonical, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in the, uh, to show the full integration. And there are, uh, you know, there are uh, various other printer platforms here. There's Vivian platform, there's a Quanta platform that you can see. There's a bunch of them that you can see in, uh, in the Intel booth as well. And so similar, same, same with the, uh, uh, same, same on the software side, we're working with a bunch of uh, uh, OSVs and ISVs on, uh, with the, we work with AMI on the BIOS side, Canonical, of course, on the orchestration stack, VMware on the orchestration stack, uh, OpenStack, and, and you know, with, there's, a, there's a bunch of uh, uh, initiatives we drive with, including, of course, with, uh, with OCP. So now I want to switch gears to talk about, you know, where we are kind of headed in the future. Uh, so I guess I, I couldn't find a good word between future and now. Uh, so I'm going to start. This is kind of in the near future. This is pooling, right? So far, I've talked about manageability, right? Be, be, being able to establish a single pane of class manageability. But here, now we are getting into an interesting space, right? So what, I, what we're trying, trying to show pictorially here is that this is, think of this, this part here as a different box 
all it has got is a bunch of drives. These are NVM, uh, uh, PCIe, NVM, uh, PCIe based uh, SSDs, right? The key requirement we have is you have a management link, which is the PSME layer, with the RST API in there. So think of this as a microcontroller that manages this. And there are two, two jobs it does. One is it needs to know, it needs to configure this, uh, this uh, pulled, uh, pulled NVMe controller. It needs to know the drive health. So that's basically platform level management at, at a storage. The second and more important role is it needs to say, you know, who's, who the bindings are. So the, the part manager who is the master is gonna come in and say, you drive one, I'm gonna bind you to server node one. At which point you need to say, oh, server node men is corresponding to this PCI link and I'm gonna bind, create that binding for you. After that point, when some OS running on server node one is gonna see drive one as if it is directly attached to it. It doesn't know any different at that point from a software standpoint. And that's the desired goal that we wanna have. And, and why do we wanna do that? First of all, it gives you the disaggregation. You're no longer bound by the mechanicals. I'm not bound by, oh, I only have two drive slots or I don't have uh, you know, 2.5 inch slots and so on, right? You can, you can make any device show up anywhere you want. And also you're not limited to device uh, you know, storage, even though I'm using storage as the example. You could do the same thing with uh, FPGA, for example. In fact, uh, uh, Inventec has a box in the Intel, Intel booth that you can show. Uh, actually, there's a live demo running there where they can actually compose a NIC and an FPGA into, your, into whatever your platform uh, compute node of choice. Uh, and, and, the, and the idea is here is that you know, you, by doing this, you are, you're allowing, I, I talked about the three principles you wanted to have, one was you know, uh, user-defined user -defined performance. The, the way to get user-defined performance is to, you wanna be able to, uh, you know, if, you, if you put the drive in my compute node, you're stuck with that drive's the capacity and its performance to that one node. Here, you have the ability to essentially take this drive, for example, and say partition this and assign this uh, capacity to multiple nodes as they need it, right? Or you can partition this in terms of performance, say assign this number of IOPS to uh, this person, however you wanna manage it. And the other beauty of going down this path is that it takes away all the single point of failures in your environment because your, your storage node could fail uh, and you still don't have any problem because your, your drives are behind this uh, your, your drives are behind this pulled NVMe controller, you can basically compose it back into some other entity and bring it back up online, right? That's the beauty of being able to do that. So the key, the key element is to be able to do this, uh, uh, to, to utilize your data center resources better through this uh, pooling mechanism. So, um, and, um, uh, I, I, and, I want, and then the second thing we're looking at is telemetry. And, uh, and again, we're gonna build it on top of Redfish. We are already working with them. It's in the, in the works. I don't think it has uh, quite been released yet, but essentially uh, there are extensions in Redfish for telemetry that allow you to do, uh, feed all the information, right? Whether it's sensors, uh, you know, uh, the temperature sensor uh, and uh, various levels of sensor, power, performance, uh, you know, security, which means, you know, where, where am I? Is, is this the right platform? Am I, released, uh, am I able to release the key that unlocks this, uh, unlocks this storage on this box? Uh, utilization and location. And location is the one that I was talking about where I, it's not the GPS location, but it's relative location within, within a failure domain. What you're trying to do is to create, uh, create an identity of the failure domain and expose the failure domain up to software so they can make smart decisions uh, based on the failure domain. Um, and uh, we also have the concept of uh, you know, both in-band and out-of-band telemetry. Uh, the, the reason for having uh, uh, out-of-band telemetry for even things like compute nodes is to essentially get a first approximate uh, mechanism to say that here is the trouble spot, right? Of all these racks in your environment, go to this rack and this server is the one that has the performance issue, for example. And then you, know, you can use your in-band tools to go in and delve deeper and find out what exactly the issue is. And that's kind of the, uh, uh, and this also, I mean, it gets, as you know, this type of information gets overwhelming after a while because you know, everybody's feeding their alerts into, into this thing. And then after 1,000, when 1,000 alerts come in, the data center administrator has no idea which one is they're gonna pay attention to. So this also is the way we built this, essentially from uh, management controller feeding into the part manager, part manager feeding into the other layers, also allows us to do this filtering to say, you know, what you're gonna surface up, right? Maybe at the end of the day, you need to say, come pay attention to rack one, 
Maybe there's an LED lit there that tells you exactly what to do. Uh, and that filtering happens there. And, and the next step is to also go into, uh, in, in, uh, feed this into the analytics layer. For example, there's a layer called Watcher in OpenStack that essentially takes this information and builds analytics and says, if these occur errors occur, you know, if the power, uh, the power plane that's supplying into memory is going bad and you're seeing memory errors, you know, it's very likely that you know, you're, uh, this, is, this is gonna be an ongoing problem. You need to just offline this, this node uh, away from your system. This type of uh, uh, artificial intelligence based decisions can be made by uh, putting algorithms in, into that orchestration layer and feeding this correlated and timestamp information is very critical. And that's one of the things that we're looking towards. Um, I deliberately put this slide in between the, pre uh, the previous slide and uh, which talked about PCIe because uh, so because the pictures look very similar, right? When you do the PCIe-based pooling, your radix is limited to whatever the PCI, PCI switches are. Today, the switches are about 96 lanes, right? And, and also, you're limited by the distance that you traverse uh, with a PCIe cable. Uh, so maybe it's, it's one rack. What if I wanted to go multiple racks and be able to pool my storage or an IO device? Uh, the solution is, for these environments, they're all based on Ethernet. So the solution is to essentially build on uh, another technology that uh, uh, SNEA is creating called NVMe or Fabric, and that allows you to essentially take these uh, PCIe uh, NVMe devices and pull them over Ethernet. So now your storage device or any other IO, uh, IO device could be multiple racks away and still show up logically as if it's under your, under your platform. This allows you to do really high radix pooling. And so, uh, if SNEA is building the protocol, what is RST doing? That's a, that's a fair question to ask, right? So what we're doing is that, so again, I mentioned you the, uh, the, the, the problem that you have in these type of things is that the storage node knows everything about the storage node, right? It knows, I have this, uh, I have these number of SSDs, I know what their health is, but when it comes to how do I bind this, this uh, logical volume to, a, to another compute node, it doesn't have the domain knowledge to do that. That's beyond the scope of that box. So that's where we come in. We establish those APIs that say, create a partition. Bind this partition with, uh, with this compute node, right? Create another partition, release this partition. Do the quality of service on this partition. Because when you have all these things and multiple people are you know, pounding on a single uh, uh, JBOF, if you will, you wanna have something that says, but by the way, this is a caching tier and this guy has higher quality of service than somebody that's using it for and, uh, you know, as uh, Ceph storage tier, for example, right? And that's to, and we we do that, and we also essentially manage the uh, security separation between in-band and out-of-band management networks in this type of environment, right? Though one of the reasons we have this RMM and everything is because we have we have the requirement for a private network, which is like a typically like a one gig network that keeps you separated out, rather than go on and touch the data plane network and spend your control plane traffic there. No administrator likes that. Okay, so I think that's, that's those, uh, and uh, uh, okay, this is, uh, I'll go through this quickly. I, I, I don't know how much time I have. I should make sure. Uh, okay, I'm going over time. So uh, this is essentially an example that shows you that you know, this uh, NVMe SSD is being assigned to this server node, and then you can take two other SSDs and assign it to another server node and so on through this mechanism. Uh, and uh, you can see some of these examples. I mean, this is, uh, I'm showing this example over uh, Ethernet, but the PCI example you can see in, in our booth. And so we composed everything else, but so why leave power alone, right? So we wanted to, uh, we are also working with, uh, uh, with a company called VPS, uh, Virtual Power Systems, to essentially do the composition. Because when you're looking at this and you're doing this at a rack scale level, so it's multiple racks. So so some racks have you know, single feed of power coming in, some racks have dual feeds coming in. Now, what your reliability, and the reason for dual racks is to have higher reliability, right? When the, one of the feeds drops off, you still have power on the other feed. But today they are static, right? Whatever you've configured it to is what you're stuck with. Uh, but through uh, RST composition, the, uh, what we are working towards is also a place, so if you see the picture here, going from uh, left to right, what happens is, the server one and, uh, has, has got a dual feed, and oh, sorry, I have a typo there. Uh, server one and two have the, uh, are on a dual, uh, the, the server one is on a dual feed, and uh, server three is on a single feed. And then as you do the composition, you can basically swap 
the, the feeds uh, through software, right? This is, this is the beauty of this, right? You're not doing this through a hardware mechanism. You know, nobody goes and pulls a plug and plugs it back in. It's just a software command. And in fact, you can also see this demo uh, at our booth where you can, you can compose power. So those are some of the uh, exciting things that are coming, uh, uh, coming next in our, in our rack scale. Uh, we believe that the, uh, to, uh, let me quickly summarize and uh, get you to your uh, drinks and uh, uh, the party in the, in the showcase. Uh, the, we believe that the rack scale uh, and the OCP directions are very well aligned. We, uh, the, we believe the OCP hardware can be well managed using the rack scale management API. In fact, there are uh, proof points of that in the showcase that you can go see. And everything we do, we, our specs, our firmware, our software, uh, all of those are available online if you go to uh, the intel.com. I only put the, this actually points you to the GitHub repository as well, uh, uh, but I also put the link to the uh, GitHub directly in a previous slide if you wanted to go, just to just want to uh, look at the code. And uh, please visit us at the Intel booth and uh, learn more about uh, some of the demos and the concepts that we are working on. And thank you very much for uh, letting me go over a few minutes. I appreciate it.